the, the thing that I am saddened by is, you know, God gave us choice, yeah? freedom to choose, that we can take the most opportunity and have everything, or we can take the least opportunity and have the, the minimal amount or even nothing. So we can even come to a place of worship and receive nothing because our heart wasn't in it. We didn't reach for God. Jesus says, seek and you shall find. Proverbs says, wisdom that you look for, you're supposed to look for it like hidden treasure. If had treasure somewhere on this property worth millions of dollars, you'd be digging stuff up. You'd be dirty, dirt under your fingernails, you'd be sweaty, you'd be here for a long time. You'd be bearing the heat of the sun because you want the treasure that is found on the earth. But there is treasure that is immaterial. When you come together, when you gather, or when you're by yourself, there's an opportunity to experience God to the fullest or just play games. We can just pre pretend, open a Bible, you know, do a checklist kind of thing. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's another thing that a friend of mine was, was talking about. He's struggling because he, he used to go to a fellowship that was like, boom, boom, boom. He says, Mike, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be, you know, I got to check up all the boxes to be, to be holy. I said, simply this, Christianity is this, and I've simplified my walk and over the years as I've gotten a little bit wiser. It's all in the greatest commandments. Number one, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's Christianity, period. So when it comes time to read the Bible, how much Bible should I read? I read because I love God and I want to know Him more. That's it. Am I enjoying my time with God? Or is this a task and a burden that is put on top of me? Then my heart is wrong. I'm going about the whole thing wrong. You know, you pray because you love God and you enjoy praying. I hope you enjoy I hope you enjoy reading. I hope you enjoy fellowshipping. Don't let it be something that you are doing mechanically. Do it something because you love God. Because that's the greatest. Nothing is greater than that. I would even say you're not even a Christian if you don't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I think you're almost a Christian. You're almost, but you're not. Because a Christian loves God. Period. Above all. Some of you, even my children, might not be there yet. But they're on the path. And I pray for them. So, if you don't want to listen, put your hands on your ears for a little bit if you don't want to get spooked. But if you think you, you can handle it, then good. I'm going to go for a little while. I'm just going to make this really short. So, I was playing. I was playing, uh, I was practicing, I was setting up my settings, we had new equipment come in, and so I was playing, you know, just play, and I'm not even singing, I'm not even singing to the Lord, right? I'm playing, and I, and I, and I, I just, this burst of sound comes at me. The, the closest thing on the earth that I can compare it to is like a whistle, like a football coach whistle or somebody that blows it really hard. This really high-pitched, powerful, like out of nowhere, just boom, all of a sudden. And you imagine the, the, the person with the whistle is blowing hard. And it, it's like you can feel the, the intensity, not just the sound that's piercing and shocking to you, but it is the intensity and the duration of it. It's like somebody blowing a whistle at you. You don't even have to look at the person who's doing that. You know they're upset. You know they're upset because it's just like like that. And there's a lot of um, intention behind that. So I hear this. This I'm just playing my guitar. I'm not even singing. You know, I'm just playing. You know, um, I got like a worship track in the back, and I'm just like doing my settings, and I just hear this this, this piercing high sound kind of scream, shout, saying, be quiet. I told me to be quiet. I think it was bad. Feel the intensity. And I just had this goosebumps, you know, chicken skin, that's what I'm saying, be quiet. And I felt this chill. That, you know, I've experienced things before, but nothing like that. And, uh, so I had a choice to make. What do I do? Do I be quiet? I had a choice. A little bit freaked out. I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't 
expecting, I wasn't planning, oh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be there and that's gonna happen to me. It just happened. I had a choice to make. Am I gonna be quiet? Part of me wanted to. So, oh, yeah, I'm out of here. This is I don't want this. I chose not to. I made more noise. <laughs> made more noise, started praying. Started calling upon the name of Jesus, calling upon the name of Yeshua, praying out loud. Kept going. And, and you know, I'm not I'm not dwelling on it at the same time. You know, I was I was really shaking up. The drive home, you know, it was, it was still fresh, and you know, I had a hard time sleeping. The next morning, um, you know, I just tried to shake it off, and basically, I was just, the, the, I didn't want to be fixated on this event. I just wanted to be fixated on who? On God. So I just, started, I just, I just, the next day, I just wanted to reflect on God. And it's all I was just thinking about God and His goodness, and Him as my Father in heaven, my Abba. As we looked at the book of Acts, you know, last week, and it, it, as you just read, in the Gospels, you see encounters of unclean spirits. You see in the book of Acts, that's kind of what they did. As they went out and preached, they encountered all these things. And one relieving thing to me is just basically, that's just normal. If you read the Bible, it's normal. But in today's modern American Christianity, it's kind of weird. You know, it's not very something that's very that we experience very much. But if you read the Bible, you see it all throughout. I mean, from the first book to the last book. There is this unseen battle that is happening all around us. Even in God, there is a there's a sense of him being unseen, of course. The only part of the Godhead that is tangible and material is the Son. The Son is the one that interacts with us and has come and taken on flesh. But the Father and the Spirit of God is immaterial. It cannot be seen. It cannot be, you can't hold it. There's even quotes from the New Testament that says no one has seen God. But have we not seen the Son of God? But is He not God? Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is not the Father. So no one has seen the Father. No one has seen in the Greek, Theos. We have seen Kyrios, the Lord. And if you want to look at the Septuagint, capital L-O-R-D is Kyrios. So in the Greek language, we identify Jesus as Kyrios in the Old and the New. He is the Lord. He is God. If you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. So there is an aspect to God that is unseen. Exodus chapter 17, please. Exodus chapter 17, starting in verse 8. We can read it too. And Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim, and mine says Moshe. So Moses said to uh, Joshua, Choose us men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I'm stationing myself on the top of the hill with the rod of God, Elohim, in my hand. And Joshua did as Moses said to him to fight with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill, and it came to be when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. Okay, so before I go on, it's not just words that we're reading. What's happening? Amalek, they're going to fight. There's going to be a battle. Moses is going to go on the top. He's going to have two people with him. Verse 11, and it came to be when Moses held up his hand and the rod, Israel prevailed. So they were winning the battle whenever Moses lifted up his hands. Then Israel began to win. Kind of doesn't make sense in you know how we think of it. If we are some a person that is absolutely naturalistic, materialistic, just everything is happening, what we can see, we, we throw away all the unseen stuff. And all we do is take on look this battle. This this army versus that army, that army is winning. Okay, because they're better fighters or whatever whatever you attribute that to. But here it says something in the unseen was happening that when Moses' hands were lifted, Israel started to win. They started winning the battle. Verse 11, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. There is something in the unseen that is happening here. Something spiritual that is manifesting itself in the, in the physical, in the material. 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. So imagine you've got to lift your hand during a battle. Your shoulder gets tired, starts to burn. Right? 
so they took the stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. So instead of standing, now he's sitting. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were standing to the going down of the sun. And here we go. And then Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So there's this unseen thing that is happening that is manifesting itself in this battle. And they win. Interesting. 2 Kings turns to the book of 2 Kings. For the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of summarize it for you guys, okay? For the sake of time, if you look in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, I found, I said, oh, this makes sense for me, what happened on Friday. It says, bring me a minstrel. Okay, a minstrel is a string instrument. Elisha is calling to, to, for an instrument to be played. And when that instrument is played, you're looking at that verse, what happens? The hand of the Lord came upon him. In fact, Elisha asked, can you, can you go get this for me? Do this for me. So he requested it. That was on purpose. That was not an accident. Go to verse 18. The term that you hopefully see is, that I, I kind of highlighted that for me, is a light thing. You're reading it, right? You know, you know exactly what it's saying. And it, it's not a light thing in the sight of God. For him to deliver the Moabites into the hands of Israel and Judah. This is a battle is going to happen. And this, this, this reflection, this quick reflection overview is saying, well, God will deliver. God will make sure that this battle happens and the winner happens. And it says, it's not a light thing. Incredible. So again, if we just are looking at completely, we're a naturalistic person, a material person, we negate all the unseen things about God, we think that battles are won and fought because who's stronger, who's more, and all that kind of stuff. But we take into consideration that there is a God, and there is the unseen, and there is a Spirit of God that is able to intervene. And God says this battle is a light. It's not a hard thing for him. 2 Kings chapter 6. So the context, if you if you already read that, is the king of Syria is surrounding Elisha. Because Elisha is tipping off, he has this info type information, and then the king of Syria is saying, who is on the side of Israel? Who's telling them where I'm going to be and where I'm not going to be? And they're saying, no one. But there is a man of God. There is Elisha. We think he's, he's hearing from God and he's talking to the king. So he sends an, uh, a group of people to, to surround him. 13. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men to capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city when the servant of the man of God got up. Okay, so this is Elisha's servant. And when early in the next morning, an army with horses and chariots surrounded the city, he said, Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? I would probably react the same if there was an army surrounding this place right here. You and around what? Oh, what are we going to do? 16. This verse really stuck out to me. Elisha responds, right? Do not be afraid. This is the term right here. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. In the material, there's only two guys. There's only Elisha and the servant. The servant is no good. He's scared. Elijah has faith. What is Elisha going to do to the army? In the material world, he can't do nothing. But what is going on? Verse 17, Elisha prayed. He prayed to the Lord. He prayed to, prayed to Yahweh. Open his eyes so that he may see. Then Yahweh opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The servant who could only in the beginning see what was material. The Lord opened his eyes and he looked around and he saw exactly not an army of the earth but an army in, in, from the heavens. Horses and chariots of fire. 18. 
As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike his army with blindness, so he struck them in blindness as Elisha had asked. Of course, the story goes on, but we're going to stop for the sake of what we're talking about. So dwell on that for a little while. There's, there are horses and chariots of fire that are around right now that we do not see. The army of heaven is at work. Wherever God is working, and they, they are there. We just don't see them. I wonder if our eyes were open right now, what would we see? So we're going to end with this. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to end with this one. But as you read, just like last week, you see the verse in front of you? I'm just going to give you the summary. And go back home and read it slowly. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Verse 1, we see the Moabites, you see these three groups of people, if you're looking at it right now. The Moabites, the Ammonites, the allies of the Ammonites. Later on, we find out in chapters, the inhabitants of Mount Seir. They are gathered against Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah. Verse 3, you see that they are seeking the Lord. Jehoshaphat, the king, proclaims a fast. It's not just a fast that he's going to do. He says, all of Judah, fast and let us seek the Lord. Verse 4, you see it in front of you. All Judah gathers together to ask help of the Lord. Verse 6, Joseph that is acknowledging God and who he is and that he is the ruler of all kingdoms, even the kingdoms against them. And he asks, who can stand against you? No one can stand against you. Verse 7, Jehoshaphat, as he's petitioning God, he says, I know that you are the one that drives out the inhabitants of the lands. Verse 8, he talks about building the sanctuary unto the Lord. Verse 9, you see it. It talks about whenever evil comes, and pestilence and famine, what do they do? They stand before the sanctuary and they cry out in their affliction to the Lord to help and to save. Verse 11, Moabites and the Ammonites, they're trying to cast them out of the inheritance that was promised to them by God Himself. Verse 12, Jehoshaphat asked God to judge them. This term, I highlight, I love it. We do not know what to do, but especially this part, our, our eyes are on you. King James says, upon thee. Our eyes are upon you. God is their source of answer and deliverance. Verse 13, all Judah, it says all Judah, men, women, children, little ones. And we don't always have to separate the little ones. The little ones can be a part of everything that we do. Verse 14, God answers. He picks a person to speak through. Verse 15, what is his message? Do not be afraid or dismayed. This is another one. Highlight this one. Put it in your memory. The battle is not yours, but God's. So this is a physical battle. And again, we revert to who is who's the best fighters, the biggest fighters, the strongest. Who has more? They're going to win. You factor in God. It says here, the battle is not yours, it is God's. Now, if you haven't read this passage yet, it's not like what we read in Exodus. Okay? It's not like, you know, the battle is happening, raise a hand, lower a hand. This is different. And this is a good kind of extreme, if you're not familiar with this. Verse 16, instructions are given by God. Tomorrow, go down against, go, go ahead, gather yourselves and meet them. Verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. This is the Lord talking. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. He says, you will not need to fight. What in the world does that mean? I thought they were supposed to go fight. But he said, but he said is, that just a com is that just comforting words? That don't worry, I'll be with you. I'll fight through you. We'll see. If you're not familiar with this passage, we'll see what happens. But I love it, it says, you shall not need to fight. You will not have to fight this battle. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat's response, the king, face to the ground, 
and all Judah falls before God and worships God. Verse 19, the Levites just they stand up and they praise God with a loud voice. Is it okay to praise God loudly? Absolutely. That's what they did, the Levites. Verse 20, here's the day. The day is happening. This is the day of the battle. Verse 20. Have faith or believe in God. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Verse 21. They appoint singers to praise. Now they're going to go into a battle and they're picking out singers. Again, in the material, it makes no sense. Right? It makes no sense. What do you need singers for? Put them in the front of the army. What are you putting singers in the front? front of the army for. In the material, it makes no sense. But with God, it's exactly what He wants. What do they sing? Praisers and singers in front of the army. So what are they going to sing about? Verse 21, let me get there. Give thanks. This doesn't sound familiar. Give thanks to the Lord for His love for His mercy endures forever. That's what they're singing. Forget what psalm that is. What is it? Psalm around Psalm 118 or so, something like that. Every other verse, His love endures forever. It says something else, His love endures forever. Verse 22, while they are singing and praising, the Lord sets ambushes against Moab and Ammon and the inhabitants of Mount Seir. While the singing is happening, happening the Lord is working and He's setting ambushes. For the three groups, these three combined into one against Jehoshaphat. Verse 23, Ammon and Moab begin to fight. So the three armies, Moabites, the Ammonites, the inhabitants of Mount Seir, two of them join forces to attack one of them. So Mount Seir is now being attacked by the Moabites and the Ammonites. And what happens here in that verse? What happens after that? Then the Moabites and the Ammonites turn on each other and they destroy each other. Basically, the enemy turned on itself and wiped itself out. They destroyed each other. So this is even more to the fact that the, the unseen is happening and it's real and it manifests itself in in real life, in real battles. 24, Judah finally arrives and beholds the dead bodies fall into the earth. No one has escaped. This is a very special chapter, uh, passage in my life. I, I reflect back on it many times. And I hope by sharing that, if you're not familiar with it, now you know, I hope you'll love it. I hope you'll take that with you. That there is an unseen and that God can fight for us. You know, and then these verses like, eyes are upon you, Lord. I'm in affliction right now. It's, 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 it's bad, but Lord, eyes are upon you. We're going to have faith. You're going to fight the battle, either through us or even in this instance, He's going to do everything for us. All we're going to see is just see His deliverance. So turning everything back. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And this would be something that would be good to memorize, to put inside of you another anchor verse in your life. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. There is the unseen that is happening. But at the same time, the model that I see in the old and the new is interaction of you know, the, the, the spiritual and then the material. It's good to acknowledge, but not to be like hypersensitive or, or, or like uh, be obsessed. You know, that's not a good thing because that's not a biblical model either. When I see the book of Acts, I see from Genesis to, to Revelation, it acknowledges, it says, and when it happens, you deal with it and you call upon the name. If it happens again, it'll happen. Hey, I, I join the ranks of normal biblical Christianity. I'm fine. He hates me. That's good. Because he knows I'm on the side of light. I am identified. I want to be known in hell. I do. I don't know about you guys. I want, I want the, the powers of darkness to know who I am. Like, like they're saying. I, I forget where it was in the book of Acts. Remember? You guys know what I'm talking about? 
some people were trying to cast out this unclean spirit, <laughs> and uh, they couldn't do it. And the, and the unclean spirit says, I know these other guys. I don't know who you are. Boom. Bust them up. Yeah. But they're not going to do that to Peter. They're not going to do it to Paul. But not because Paul is, is, is spiritual superman. It's because he is actually reliant and connected and dependent upon God himself. So I hope that was helpful to you. Take that, take these verses. Exodus chapter 17, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Meditate upon it, read it this week, and know that God is close, God is able to work. And it makes sense that why I wasn't even singing. But like Elisha, just the minstrel played. I was just playing one string instrument, my minstrel, my modern day minstrel. And things in the in the heavenlies were happening. So, again, acknowledge that it's there. Don't get fixated upon it. The biggest thing we can do to fight spiritual wickedness is not, not practice, not trying to be all spiritual, is preaching the gospel. Because that's, what, that's part of deliverance. Some people need to be delivered out of whatever it is on the earth. It could be addictions, it could be uh, anger, it could be certain cycles that they do. They self-sabotage themselves. Or it could, it could be unclean spirits. God wants deliverance for, for the people in darkness. And He wants them ultimately to come to salvation. So the best thing we can do is operate in the spiritual, not by, by doing something weird, but simply preaching the gospel, simply praying that people would be saved. Because that's when the Holy Spirit takes residence in places that it didn't live before. And people can be made new. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this time.